The degree of knowledge to which some of them attended was considerable. Many of the truths of Christianity seemed fixed in their mind, especially in some instances, so that they would speak to me of them and ask such questions about them as were necessary to render them more plain and clear to their understandings. The children also, and young people, who attended the school made considerable proficiency, at least some of them, in their learning, so that had they understood the English language well, they would have been able to read somewhat readily in a psalmster. But that which was most of all desirable and gave me the greatest encouragement amidst many difficulties and disconsolate hours was that the truth of God's word seemed at times to be attended with some power upon the hearts and consciences of the Indians, and especially they appeared evident in a few instances who were awakened to some sense of their miserable estate by nature and appeared solicitous for deliverance from it. Several of them came on their own accord to discourse with me about their soul's concerns, and some with tears inquired what they should do to be saved, and whether the God that Christians served would be merciful to those that had been frequently drunk, etc. And although I cannot say I have satisfactory evidences of their being, quote, renewed in the spirit of the mind, unquote, and savingly converted to God, yet the Spirit of God did, I apprehend, in such a manner attend the means of grace and so operate the, upon their minds thereby as might justly afford matter of encouragement to hope that God designed good to them and that he was preparing his way into their souls. There likewise appeared a reformation in the lives and manners of the Indians, their idolatrous sacrifices of which was, there was but one or two that I know of after my coming among them were wholly laid aside, and their hedonistic custom of dancing, hollering, etc., they seemed in a considerable measure to have abandoned, and I could not but hope that they were reformed in some manner from the sin and drunkenness. They likewise manifested a regard for the Lord's Day, and not only behaved soberly themselves, but took care also to keep their children in order. Yet, after all, I must confess that as there were many hopeful appearances among them, so there were some things more discouraging. And while I rejoice to observe any seriousness and concern among them about the affairs of their souls, still I was not without continual fear and concern least some encouraging appearances might prove like a morning cloud that passes away. When I had spent near a year with the Indians, I informed them that I expected to leave them in the spring then approaching, and to be sent to another tribe of Indians at a great distance from them. On hearing this, they appeared very sorrowful, and some of them endeavored to persuade me to continue with them, urging that they had now heard so much about their soul's concerns that they could never more be willing to live as they had done without a minister, and further instructions in the way to heaven, etc. Whereupon I told them they ought to be willing that others also should hear about their soul's concerns, seeing those needed it as much as themselves. Yet, further to dissuade me from going, they added that those Indians to whom I had thoughts of going, as they had heard, were not willing to become Christians as they were, and therefore urged me to tarry with them, I then told them that they might receive further instructions without me, that the Indians, to whom I expected to be sent, could not, there being no minister near to teach them. And hereupon I advised them, in case I should leave them, and be sent elsewhere, to remove to Stockbridge, where they might be supplied with land and conveniences of living, and be under the ministry of the Reverend Mr. Sargent, with which advice and proposal they seemed disposed to comply. On April 6, 1744, I was ordered and directed by the correspondence for the Indian Mission to take leave of the people with whom I had then spent a full year and to go as soon as conveniently I could to a tribe of Indians on the Delaware River in Pennsylvania. These orders I soon attended, and on April 29, took leave of my people who were most mostly removed to Stockbridge under the care of the Reverend Mr. Sargent. I then set out on my journey toward Delaware, and on May 10th met with a number of Indians in a place called Me-On-Sink. 
about 140 miles from Kananayumik, the place where I spent the last year and directly in my way to Delaware River. With these Indians, I spent some time and first addressed their king in a friendly manner, and after some discourse and attempts to contract a friendship with him, I told him I had a desire for his benefit and happiness to instruct them in Christianity, at which he laughed, turned his back upon me, and went away. I then addressed another principal man in the same manner, who said he was willing to hear me. After some time, I followed the king into his house, and renewed my discourse with him, but he declined talking and left the affair to another, who appeared to be a rational man. He began and talked very warmly, near a quarter of an hour together. He inquired why I desired the Indians to become Christians, seeing the Christians were so much worse than the Indians in their present state. The Christians, he said, would lie, steal, and drink, worse than the Indians. It was they who first taught the Indians to be drunk, and they stole from one another to that degree that their rulers were obliged to hang them for it, and that was not sufficient to deter others from the like practice. But the Indians, he added, were none of them ever hanged for stealing, and yet they did not steal half so much, and he supposed that if the Indians should become Christians, they would then be as bad as these. And hereupon he said, they would live as their fathers lived, and go where their fathers were when they died. I then freely owned, Langman, Lang, lamented, and joined with them in condemning the ill conduct of some who are called Christians, told them these were not Christians in heart, and I hated such wicked practices, and did not desire the Indians to become such as these. And when he appeared calmer, I asked him if he was willing that I should come and see them again. He replied he should be willing to see me again as a friend if I would not desire them to become Christians. I then bid them farewell, farewell and prosecuted my journey towards Delaware. And May 13th, I arrived at a place called by the Indians Sak Ha Yu Wotong near the forts of Delaware in Pennsylvania. Here also, when I came to the Indians, I saluted their king and others, in a manner I thought most engaging, and soon afterward informed the king of my desire to instruct them in the Christian religion. After he had consulted a few minutes with two or three old men, he told me he was willing to hear. I then preached to those few that were present, who appeared very attentive and well disposed. And the king in particular seemed both to wonder and at the same time to be well pleased with what I taught them, respecting the divine being, etc. And since that time, he has ever showed himself friendly to me, giving me free liberty to preach in his house whenever I think fit. Here, therefore, I have spent the greater part of the summer past preaching usually in the king's house. The number of Indians in this place is but small. Most of those that formerly belonged here are dispersed and removed to places further back in the country. There are not more than ten houses hereabouts that continue to be inhabited, and some of these are several miles distant from others, which makes it difficult for the Indians to meet together so frequently as could be desired. When I first began to preach here, the number of my hearers was very small, often not exceeding twenty or twenty-five persons, but towards the latter part of the summer their number increased, so that I had frequently had forty persons or more at once and oft times most belonging to those parts came together to hear me preach. The effects which the truths of God's word have had upon some of the Indians in this place are somewhat encouraging. Sontre of them are brought to renounce idolatry and to decline partaking of those feasts which they used to offer in sacrifice to certain supposed unknown powers, and some few among them have for a considerable time manifested a serious concern for their soul's eternal welfare, and still continue to inquire the way to Zion. With such diligence, affection, and becoming solitude has given me reason to hope that God, who I trust, has begun this work in them, will carry it on until it shall issue in their saving conversion to himself. These not only detest their old idolatrous notions, but strive also to bring their friends off 
from them. And as they are seeking salvation for their own souls, so they seem de desirous, and some of them take pains, that others might be excited to do the like. July 24th. Road about 17 miles westward over a hideous mountain to a number of Indians, got together near 30 of them, preached to them in the evening, and lodged among them, was weak and felt in some degree disconsolate, yet could have no freedom in the thought of any other circumstances or business in life. All my desire was the conversion of the heathen, and all my hope was in God. God does not suffer me to please or comfort myself with hopes of seeing friends returning to my dear acquaintance and enjoying worldly comforts." Unquote. The next day he preached to these Indians again and then returned to the Irish settlement and there preached to a numer numerous congregation. There was a considerable appearance of awakening in the congregation. Thursday he returned home exceedingly fatigued and spent, still in the same frame of mortification to the world and solicitous for the advancement of Christ's kingdom. On this day he writes thus, quote, I have felt this week more of the spirit of a pilgrim on earth than perhaps ever before, and yet so desirous to see Zion's prosperity that I was not so willing to leave this scene of sorrows as I used to be. Unquote. The two remaining days of the week he was very ill and complains of wanderings, dullness, and want of spiritual fervency and sweetness. On the Sabbath, he was con continued by illness, not able to go out to preach. After this, his illness increased upon him, and he continued very ill all the week, and says that, quote, he thought he never before endured such a season of distress and weakness, that his nature was so spent that he could neither stand, sit, nor lay with any quiet, that he was exercised with extreme faintness and sickness at his stomach that his mind was as much disordered as his body, seemed to be stupid, and without any kind of affections towards all objects, and yet perplexed to think that he lived for nothing, that precious time rolled away and he could do nothing but trifle, and that it was a season wherein Satan buffeted him with some particular temptations. On Tuesday of this week, he wrote the following letter to an intimate and dear friend. It indicates affections of no ordinary degree, chastened, or spiritual. Quote, Forks of Delaware, July 31st, 1744. Certainly the greatest and noblest pleasure of intellect creatures must result from their acquaintance with the blessed God and with their own rational and immortal souls. Oh, how divinely sweet and entertaining is it to look into our own souls when we can find all our powers and passions united and engaged in pursuit after God, our whole souls longing and passionately breathing after a conformity to Him and the full enjoyment of Him. Verily no hours pass away with so much divine pleasure as those which are spent in communion with God and our own hearts. Oh, how sweet is the spirit of devotion, a spirit of sweetness and divine solemnity a spirit of gracious simplicity, love, and tenderness. Oh, how desirable and how profitable to the Christian life is a spirit of holy watchfulness and a godly jealousy over ourselves when our souls are afraid of nothing so much as that we shall grieve and offend the blessed God, whom at such times we apprehend or at least hope to be a father and friend, whom we then love and long to please rather than to be happy ourselves, or at least we delight to derive our happiness from pleasing and glorifying Him. Surely this is a pious temper, worthy of the highest ambition and closest pursuit of intellectual creatures and holy Christians. Oh, how vastly superior are the pleasure, peace, and satisfaction derived from these divine frames to that which we, allow sometimes pursue in things impertinent and trifling. Our own bitter experience teaches us that, quote, in the midst of such laughter, the heart is sorrowful, unquote, and there is no true satisfaction but in God. But alas, how shall we obtain and retain this sweet spirit of religion and devotion? Let us follow the Apostle's direction, 
Philippians 2, verse 12, and labor upon the encouragement which he there mentions, verse 13. For it is only, for it is God only who can afford us this favor, and he will be sought too, and it is fit that we should wait upon him for so rich a mercy. Only the God of all grace afford us the grace and influences of his divine spirit, and help us that we may, from our hearts, esteem it our greatest liberty and happiness, that whether, quote, whether we live or may live to the Lord, or whether we die, we may die to the Lord, unquote, that in life and death we may be his. I am in a very poor state of health. I think scarce ever poor, but through divine goodness I am not discontented under my weakness and confinement to this wilderness. I bless God for this retirement. I never was more thankful for anything than I have been of late for the necessity I am under of self-denial in many respects. I love to be a pilgrim and stranger in this wilderness. It seems most fit for such a poor, ignorant, worthless, despised creature as I. I would not change my present mission for any other business in the whole world. I may tell you freely without vanity and ostentation, God has of late given me great freedom and fervency in prayer when I have been so weak and feeble that my nature seemed as if it would speedily dissolve. I feel as if my all was lost and I was undone for this world if the poor heathen may not be converted. I feel in general different from what I did. When I saw you last, at least more crucified to all the enjoyments of life, it would be very refreshing to me to see you here in this desert, especially in my weak, disconsolate hours. But I think I could be content never to see you or any of my friends again in this world if God would bless my labors here to the conversions of the poor Indians. I have much that I could willingly communicate to you, which I must omit till Providence gives me leave to see each other. In the meantime, I rest. Your obliged friend and servant, servant David Brennan. Concerning the next five days, he writes thus, quote, Lord's Day, August 5th, was still very poor. But though very weak, I visited and preached to the poor Indians twice, and was strengthened vastly beyond my expectations. Indeed, the Lord gave me some freedom and fevency in addressing them, though I had not strength enough to stand, but was obliged to sit down the whole time. Towards night, was extremely weak, faint, sick, and full of pain. I had continued much in the same state I was in last week, though most of this, it being now Friday, unable to engage in any business, frequently unable to pray in the family. I am obliged to leave all my thoughts and concerns, run at random, for I have not strength to read, meditate, or pray, and this naturally perplexes my mind. I seem to myself like a man that has all his estate embarked in one small boat, unhappily going adrift down a swift turn. The poor owner stands on the shore and looks and laments his loss. But alas, though my all seems to be adrift, and I stand and see it, I dare not lament, it, for this sinks my spirits more and aggravates my bodily disorders. I am forced, therefore, to divert myself to trifles, although at the same time I am afraid and often feel as if I was guilty of the misimprovement of time, and oftentimes my conscience is so exercised with this miserable way of spending time that I have no peace, though I have no strength of mind or body to improve it to better purpose. Oh, that God would pity my distressed state. End quote. The next three weeks, his Ill illness was less severe, and he was in some degree capable of business, both public and private. 
though he had some turns wherein his indisposition prevailed to a great degree. He had generally also much more inward assistance and strength of mind. He often expresses great longings for the enlargement of Christ's kingdom, especially by the conversion of the heathen to God, and speaks of this hope as all his delights and joy. He continues still to express his usual desires after holiness, living to God, and a sense of his own unworthiness. He, several times, speaks of his appearing to himself, the vilest creature on earth. And one says that he verily thought there were none of God's children who fell so far short of that holiness and perfection in their obedience which God requires as he. He speaks of his feeling more dead than ever to the enjoyments of the world. He sometimes mentions the special systems which he had at this time in preaching to the Indians and the appearances of religious concern among them. He speaks also of assistance in prayer for absent friends and especially ministers and candidates for the ministry and of much comfort which he enjoyed in the company of some ministers who came to visit him. Quote, September 1st was so far strengthened after a season of great weakness that I was able to spend two or three hours in writing on a divine subject, enjoyed some comfort and sweetness in things divine and sacred, and as my bodily strength was in some measure restored, so my soul seemed to be somewhat vigorous and engaged in the things of God. Lord's Day, September 2nd, was unable to speak to my poor Indians with much concern and feverancy, and I am persuaded that God enabled me to exercise faith in Him while I was speaking to them. I perceived that some of them were afraid to hearken to and embrace Christianity, lest they should be enchanted and poisoned by some of the Hala, but I was enabled to plead with them not to fear these, and confiding in God for safety and perseverance. I bet a challenge to all these powers of darkness to do their worst on me first. I told my people that I was a Christian and asked them why the Pollard did not bewitch and poison me. I scarcely ever felt more sensible of my own unworthiness in this action. I saw that the honor of God was concerned in the affair and deserved to be preserved, not from selfish views, but for a testimony of the divine power and goodness, and of the truth of Christianity, and that God might be glorified. Afterwards, I found my soul rejoicing God for his assisting grace." Unquote. After this, he went a journey into New England, and was absent from the place of his abode at the forts of Delaware about three weeks. He was in a feeble state the greater part of the time, but in the latter part of the journey, he found that he gained much in health and strength, as to the mind, the state of mind, and his religious and spiritual exercises, it was much with him, as usual in his journeys, excepting that the frame of his mind seemed more generally to be comfortable. But yet there are complaints of some uncomfortable seasons, wants of feverancy, and wants of retirement and time alone with God. In his journey, he did not forget the Indians but once again speaks of his longings for their conversions. Quote, September 26, wrote home to the forts of Delaware, What reason have I to bless God, who has preserved me in riding more than 420 miles, and has, quote, kept all my bones, that not one of them has been broken, unquote. My health, likewise, is greatly recovered. Oh, that I could dedicate my all to God. This is all the return I can make to him. September 27th was somewhat melancholy. Had not much freedom and comfort in prayer. My soul is disconsolate when God is withdrawn. September 28th spent the day in prayer, reading, and writing. Felt some small degree of warmth in prayer and some desires of the enlargement of Christ's kingdom by the conversion of the heathen and that God would make me a, quote, chosen vessel to bear his name before them, unquote, long for grace to enable me to be faithful, unquote. 
The next day, he speaks of the same earnest desires for the advancement of Christ's kingdom and the conversion of the Indians, but complains gently of the ill effects of the diversions of his late journey, as on fixing his mind from that degree of engagement, engagement, feverancy, and watchfulness, which he enjoyed before. The like complaints are continued the day after. Quote, October 1st, was engaged this day in making preparations for my intended journey to the Sukhuhana, withdrew several times to the woods for secret duties, and endeavored to plead for the divine presence to go with me to the poor pagans to whom I was going to preach the gospel. Towards night, rode about four miles and met Brother Byram. Footnote. Minister at a place called Rock Siticus, about 40 miles from Brennan's lodgings, and a footnote, who was come at my desire to be my companion in travel to the Indians. I rejoiced to see him, and I trust God made his conversation profitable to me. I saw him, as I thought, more dead to the world, its anxious cares and alluring objects, than I was. And this made me look within myself and gave me a greater sense of guilt, ingratitude, and misery. October 2nd, set out on my journey in company with my dear brother Byram, and my interpreter and two chief Indians from the forts of Delaware, traveled about 25 miles and lodged in one of the last houses on our road, after which there was nothing but a hideous and hollowing wilderness. October 3rd, we went on our way into the wilderness and found the most difficult and dangerous traveling by far than ever any of us had seen. We had scarce anything else but lofty mountains, deep valleys, and hideous rocks to make our way through. However, I felt some sweetness in divine things part of the day and had my mind intensely engaged in meditation on a divine subject. Near night, my beast on which I rode hung one of her legs in the rocks and, I, and fell down under me, but through divine goodness I was not hurt. However, she broke her leg, and being in such a hideous place, and near thirty miles from any house, I saw nothing that could be done to preserve her life, and was so obliged to kill her, and to pro prosecute my journey on foot. This accident made me admire the divine goodness to me, that my bones were not broken, and the multitude of them filled with strong pain. Just that night we kindled a fire, cut up a few bushes, and made a shelter over our heads to save us from the frost, which was very hard that night. In committing ourselves to God by prayer, we lay down on the ground and swept, slept quietly." Unquote. The next day they went forward on their journey, and at night took up their lodgings in the woods in like manner. Quote, October 5th, we reached the Sioux Kihana River at the place called spelled O P E H O L H A U P U N G and found there twelve Indian houses. After I had saluted the king in a friendly, friendly manner, I told him my business and that my desire was to teach them Christianity. Afterwards, after some consultation, the Indians gathered and I preached to them. And when I had done, I asked if they would hear me again. They replied that they would consider it, and soon after sent me word that they would immediately attend if I would preach, which I did with freedom both times. When I asked them again whether they would hear me further, they replied they would the next day. I was exceeding sensible of the impossibility of doing anything for the poor heathen without special assistance from above and my soul seemed to rust on God and leave it to him to do, as he pleased in that which I saw was his own cause. Indeed, through divine goodness, I had felt somewhat of this frame most of the time while I was traveling thither, and in some measure before I set out. October 6th, rose early and besought the Lord for help in my great work. Near noon, preached again to the Indians, and in the afternoon, visited them from house to house and visited them and invited them to come and hear me again the next day and put off their hunting design which they were just entering upon till Monday. 
This night, I trust, the Lord stood by me to encourage and strengthen my soul. I spent more than an hour in secret retirement, was unable to pour out my heart before God for the increase of grace in my soul, for ministerial endowments, for success among the poor Indians, for God's ministers and people, for distant dear friends, etc. Blessed be God, unquote. The next day, he complains of great wants of fixedness and intenseness in religion, so that he could not keep any spiritual thought one minute without distraction, which occasioned anguish of spirit. He felt amazingly guilty and extremely miserable, and cries out, quote, O oh my soul, what death it is to have the affections unable to center in God, by reason of darkness and consequent roving after that satisfaction elsewhere. That is only to be found here, unquote. However, he preached twice to the Indians with considerable freedom and power, but was afterwards dampered by the objections that made they made against Christianity. In the evening, in a sense of his great defects in preaching, he, quote, entreated God not to impute to him blood guiltiness, unquote, but yet was at the same time enabled to rejoice in God, quote, October 8th, visited the Indians with the design to take my leave of them, supposing they would this morning to go out to hunting early, but beyond my expectation and hope, they desired to hear me preach again. I gladly complied with their request, and afterwards endeavored to answer their objections against Christianity. Then they went away, and we spent the rest of the afternoon in reading and prayer, intending to go homeward very early the next day. My soul was in some measure refreshed in secret prayer and meditation. Blessed be the Lord for all his goodness. October 9th, we rose about four in the morning and commending ourselves to God by prayer and asking his special protection, which set out on our journey homeward about five and traveled with great steadiness till past six at night and then made us a fire in a shelter of barks and so rested. I had some clear and comfortable thoughts on the divine subject by the way, towards night. In the night, the wolves howled around us, but God preserved us, unquote. The next day, they rose early and set forward and traveled that day till they came to an Irish settlement with which Brennan was acquainted and lodged there. He speaks of some sweetness and divine things and thankfulness to God for his goodness to him in this journey. Though attended with shame, for his barrenness. On Thursday, they, he continued in the same place, and both he and Mr. Byram preached there to their people. October 12th, quote, rode home to my lodgings, where I poured out my soul to God in secret prayer, and endeavored to bless him for his abundant goodness to me in my late journey. I scarcely ever enjoyed more health, at least of latter years, and God marvelously and almost miraculously supported me under the fatigues of the way and traveling on foot. Blessed be the Lord who continually preserves me in all my ways, unquote. On Saturday he went again to the Irish settlement to spend the Sabbath there, his Indians being gone. Lord's Day, October 14th. I was much confused and perplexed in my thoughts. I could not pray and was almost discouraged, thinking I should never be able to preach any more. Afterwards, God was pleased to give me some relief from these confusions. But still I was afraid and even troubled before God. I went to the place of public worship, lifting up my heart to God for assistance and grace. In my great work, and God was gracious to me, helping me to plead with Him for holiness and to use the strongest arguments with Him, drawn from the incarnation and sufferings of Christ for this very end, that men might be made holy. Afterwards, I was much assisted in preaching. I know not that ever God helped me to preach in a more close and distinguishing manner for the trial of men's state through the infinite goodness of God. I felt what I spoke. He enabled me to treat on divine truth with uncommon clearness and yet 
I was so sensible of my defects in preaching that I could not be proud of my performance, as at some times, and thus be the Lord for this mercy. In the evening I longed to be entirely alone to bless God for help in a time of extremity, and longed for great degrees of holiness that I might show my gratitude to God." Unquote. The next morning he spent some time before sunrise in prayer in the same sweet and grateful frame of mind that he had been in the evening before, and afterwards went to his Indians and spent some time in teaching and exhorting them. Quote, October 16, felt the spirit of solemnity and watchfulness, was afraid I should not live to and upon God, longed for more intenseness and spirituality, spent the day in writing, frequently lifting up my heart to God, for more heavenly mindedness. In the evening, enjoyed sweet assistance in prayer, thirsted and pleaded to be as holy as the blessed angels, longed for ministerial gifts and graces and success in my work, was sweetly assisted in the duty of intercession and enabled to remember and plead for numbers of dear friends and of Christ's ministers." Unquote. He seemed to have much of the same frame of mind the two next days. Quote, October 19th, felt an abasing sense of my own impurity and unholiness, and felt my soul melt and mourn that I had abused and grieved a very gracious God, who was still kind to me, notwithstanding all my unworthiness. My soul enjoyed a sweet season of bitter repentance and sorrow, that I had wronged that blessed God, who I was persuaded was reconciled to me, in his dear son. My soul was now tender, devout, and solemn. And I was afraid of nothing but sin, and afraid of that in every action and thought." Unquote. The four next days were manifestly spent in a most constant tenderness, watchfulness, diligence, and self-defiance. But he complains of wanderings of mind languor of affections, etc. Quote, October 24th, near noon, rode to my people, spent some time and prayed with them, and felt the frame of a pilgrim on earth. Long much to leave this gloomy mansion, but yet found the exercise of patience and resignation. And as I returned home from the Indians, spent the whole time in lifting up my heart to God, in the evening, enjoyed a blessed season alone in prayer, was enabled to cry to God with a childlike spirit for the space of near an hour, enjoyed a sweet freedom in supplicating for myself, for dear friends, ministers, and some who are preparing for that work, and for the Church of God, and long to be as lively myself in God's service as the angels. October 25th was busy in writing was very sensible of my absolute dependency on God in all respects, saw that I could do nothing, even in those affairs, for which I have sufficient natural faculties, unless God should smile upon my attempt, quote, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, unquote. I saw was a sacred truth. October 26. In the morning, my soul was melted with a sense of divine goodness, and mercy to such a vile, unworthy worm. I delighted to lean upon God and place my whole trust in Him. My soul was exceedingly grieved for sin and prized and longed after holiness. It wounded my heart deeply, yet sweetly, to think how I had abused a kind God. I longed to be perfectly holy, but I might not grieve a gracious God, who will continue to love, notwithstanding His love is abused. I longed for holiness more for this end than I did for my own happiness' sake, and yet this was my greatest happiness, never more to dishonor, but always to glorify the blessed God. Afterwards, rode up to the Indians in the afternoon, etc. Unquote. The four next days, he was exercised with much disorder and pain of body, with a degree of melancholy and gloominess of mind, bitterly complaining of deadness and unprofitableness, yet mourning and longing after God.